Hello Ligor, welcome and welcome everybody else. <clears throat> so today is Easter special, which means we are going to take a look at a team that has been picked by Discord and in this case it's gonna be about Operation Underpoid, which is uh, an operation that was launched by allies uh, into Grand Czech Republic at the time Protectorate of Bohemia that was under control of Third Reich to assassinate a Rex Protector Reinhard Heinrich and we'll learn about all these things eventually but first we all have to start with basics so let's take a look at the map so you can see this is how Austria-Hungary was looking like before the First World War. So Czech Republic is right here. It was part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire and it has been like this since 1500s when the Czech kings lost a big battle against the Austrians and then our territory and crown was incorporated into their lands and then they expanded even further which means uh, on the outbreak of First World War, they encompassed all of this territory, these various nations. Mm, Czech Republic has, uh, like Czech lands, have been fairly reasonably developed since the land is fairly fertile and it has mountainous border, so that was fairly good for defense. While it had also quite developed industry. For example, the first ever car that was created in the Austro-Hungarian Empire was actually made in, uh, I think, Brno in Czech Republic. So we had quite a big industrial capacity and also around 13 million people lived here, encompassing Slovakia as well, because Czech Republic itself would not become a self-governed state even after World War I because the Allies felt like it would be too weak to defend itself against potential enemies like Germany or even Poland or Russia because these nations were uh, much larger. So they instead decided that Czechs and Slovaks should make their own state together and proceed uh, like that. This is how it looked like on the offset of World War I. Of course, uh, Austria-Hungary was part of the Central Powers during World War I, which means that they were allies of Germany, and Austria-Hungary was primarily fighting Italians and Serbians, as well as Russians. And Czechs were a major part of the Austro-Hungarian army, however, the Austro-Hungarian army did not really do very well in World War I. It had massive casualties and even bigger numbers of um, captured troops. And it was due to uh, undersupply, incompetent generals and also very dull strategic thinking. So especially Russians captured many of Austro-Hungarian troops in combat and Germans all often had to bail them out by helping Austro-Hungarians out during some offensives, taking some cities back and generally just keeping them in the war because Austro-Hungary would have been overrun if they didn't help them. This resulted in many of the Czech units being in the Russian captivity. However, Czechs really did not like to participate in this war because Czechs are a Slavic nation and they as fellow Slavs were not really pumped about fighting Russians, other fellow Slav nation. This is um, similar reason why on the offset of World War I Russians actually joined the war because they felt like Austro-Hungarians were oppressing Serbians which were Slavs. So they, uh, they seen it as a Germanic uh, aggression towards other Slav nations. That's why the war, uh, or that was their justification for it. Of course, nobody cares about the people, not even remotely, but uh, the war has been brewing for a long time, so it just kicked off and then Austro-Hungary had a lot of problems, resulted in many, many Czech uh, 
uh, divisions being captured and then from these divisions they actually formed uh, Czech legions which were guys that put together their um, old organization and formed their own uh, units under the guise of uh, returning and fighting against the Austro-Hungarian troops and Germans to retake back Czech and Slovak countries and establishing our first ever republic. And you can see there is a photograph of one of the units. Many of them were wounded uh, during the fight. Most of them were in Russia uh, on their um, like when they were the most uh, numerous. They were about 60,000 fighting men strong and initially the Russians did not really give them many weapons or other equipment because they did not consider them very good. However, thanks to their ingenuity, they quickly convinced them otherwise, capturing many weapons and fighting with a very high zeal. Uh, they established their own units and standards inspired by their own uh, historical coat of arms. So they added them to their standards. You can see a check line there. This is a Slovak cross. This is a Silesian uh, eagle. And this is Moravian eagle, I think. Might be confusing to do. And they uh, unfortunately uh, happened to be in the center of the Russian Revolution because when it kicked off and Russia withdrew from the war. Uh, the Czech legions were actually not able to pass through the Russian territory back to their country because the war was still going on and they would be considered hostiles and the Russians forbade them access. So what they had to do is organize into their own units and use the chaos that was happening during the Russian Revolution to capture as many railway stations as they could and embark on trains that they would fortify. They even loaded artillery pieces on it. Each train would be like a self-moving army with workshops, uh, wagons, barracks wagons, armory wagons, things like that. And they would go with these trains uh, across Russia, across the whole span of it until they reached Vladivostok and they were able to board ships that took them to USA and then they returned the other way around to Europe after World uh, War One ended. So it was quite a journey for them. Uh, I think from the 60,000, just about 5,000 died from their injuries. Many more were critically injured, but overall it was considered a kind of moment of pride for Czechs because these people were actually experienced veterans after the war. Hey, Mark Kalp, welcome. Yes, they seized Russian gold reserves, and not only that, they also captured or got hold of the main official from white Russian faction, and they had to give him up at one of the railway stations, because what Russians did when they found out that Czechs were actually boarding these trains and embarking armed across their country, they, of course, there was a big chaos because there was a civil war going on. But Bolsheviks tried to instruct their troops to, by each intersection that the trains passed, they would stop them and they would request a portion of their weapons to be given up. And this would happen at each railway station, which means that they would progressively give up more and more weapons. And that happened until a point when they decided that this was a scheme to make them defenseless and then capture them because they would be considered an uh, enemy of the state, so they would be most likely sent to gulags. Which meant that they resisted in one of the railway stations, there was a big firefight, and after that the Czech legions uh, really started going ham on the Russians. And with the help of the armored trains, they managed to pull through a lot of the areas, they even uh, in some of the more remote areas in the Siberia, they actually like were often stopped by the local warlords, basically, because the Russia was in total disarray at that point, and these warlords would often block their path and request them, like, uh, you need to take out this rival village and then we will let you pass, or they would force them to trade some of their weapons for supplies, things like that. Hello, Finboy, welcome. And in the end, as I said, from the 60,000 that set off, 
just about 5,000 died and 55,000 of them made, them made it back to Czech lands after World War One ended. So this is how the land distribution uh, actually ended up after World War One. So uh, we are not going to be focusing on Germany. They had to give up some territory, make some concessions. They were forced into paying a huge amount of war reparations while Czechoslovakia and generally Austro-Hungarian Empire was dismantled and it split into many different countries. So the Slavic countries in the Balkans actually formed into Yugoslavia, which that went very well during the Cold War and later. <laughs> uh, not any differences between them at all, right? And then we have Hungary, Austria, Czechoslovakia, Romania and Bulgaria. First thing the Czechoslovak armed forces did was invade Russia from the inside. <laughs> Very German. <laughs> yeah. Well, they actually... Um, they were quite successful in fighting the Germans and Austro-Hungarians. Definitely more effective than some of the Tsarist units when the Russia was still participating in the First World War. And they actually participated in many major battles when they won some glory. And they were pretty effective and zealous, as I said. Mm. Overall, the Russians did not really trust them much though, because they, uh, they they forced them to swear an allegiance to Tsar. However, when the civil war, war broke out, um, Tsar was not really a thing anymore. So they felt like their uh, word uh, will not be broken by them just packing up and leaving for their country because they did not want to be involved in the mess that was happening. Uh, it is noted at the time that the officers from the Czech legions actually considered going directly to Moscow to overthrow the government of Bolsheviks and establish a democratic republic. However, they decided against it. There was a vote held because the legions actually were inspired by establishing a republic, so they decided that everything will be voted upon. So they even like split the votes among soldiers, not only the officers decided that, and they decided that the best course of action would be to uh, get hold of whatever they can and then embark on voyage to get home. However, they could not do it this way, so they had to go all the way around the world. In Russia, many people actually like went with them at some point. They even brought some civilians and they brought some of them even to Europe after. So that's kind of strange. Some of them were also married on the trains. Uh, it's, it was like they lived on the trains for quite a while. As I said, it was uh, definitely not pretty like living conditions wise, but they were pretty effective. So when they returned back, they found their nation established as a republic with Slovaks as our uh, basically uh, I would call it other um, nation that was incorporated into Czechoslovakia. So the legionaries who came back were seen as heroes. They were veterans, so they had much combat experience. Unlike some other nations, we actually had a pretty sizable army at this point, which also had um, capability to really um, conduct fights effectively because they were experienced. So we were not seen as an easy target directly from the offs uh, like offset of the interwar period. However, that would soon change because we all know what happened in Germany later and also there were some other conflicts with Poland. So let's take a look at industry and fortifications. So in total in the Czech, uh, Czechoslovakia there were 13 million citizens of those, there were 3 million Germans and 8 million Czechs and Slovaks. The rest of the population were Jews, Hungarians and other various uh, nationalities. And we were 10th country in industrial output in the world in 1928. So the industry was quite well developed. However, after 19, 1928, there was a big uh, economic crisis. So that kind of put hold to that, but that 
went for everyone in the world. We had big unemployment after it, but we managed to recover. And in 1935, we started building extensive fortifications along the border. So we saw Germans as enemies at this point because the rhetoric was getting ever more um, hostile. So Czechs started to build fortifications along the borders with Germany. However, we did not build fortifications on the border with Austria or Hungary or Poland. These fortifications were quite expansive. They were not only infantry fortifications, but also artillery bunkers and even like big forts with many fortified areas of forests that were mapped for direct strikes without even needing a visual confirmation of enemy presence. So that was quite handy because you could target an area that you know enemies would funnel in when they approach an area. So that would be how even the machine gun positions would actually be occupied, is that you would actually sit inside a fortified concrete shelter that was a machine gun nest, and then you would have a big map of your surrounding area, like directly, like each tree, everything painted in front of you on the wall. And the only thing sticking out of the fortification would be your machine gun. And with this, you would be able to Mm, enjoy maximum cover while being able to uh, evaluate uh, information that would be given to you by spotter in this uh, uh, you could say tower and he would interpret information to you and say enemy on 38 degrees and then you would shift the machine gun and shoot directly there without needing visual confirmation there were some weaknesses to these fortifications of course especially the Austrian border which proved instrumental because we know that there was an Anschluss of Austria and it was incorporated into the Third Reich, which happened directly before events of the Munich Agreement. So let's take a look. Since Czechs saw Germans as enemies, they actually started a mobilization. So in 1938, there was a general mobilization call and in total, Czech army, Czechoslovak army was at 42 divisions, 1.5 million men, 350 tanks, 19, 950 planes, and we had most guns per capita in the world, which meant like amongst the civilian population. This always baffled me because the Czech generals and officers came from the Austro-Hungarian army and they had directly experienced how useless fixed fortifications were at Tremysl and Russian forts. Yes, definitely, they were aware of that. However, our mountainous terrain was our only ch chance against the Germans, basically, because we had no choice but to fortify. And we used some different technology and, as I said, some of the things that are... Mm, like improved compared to just regular forts like you would have at other places yeah uh it wasn't an option so we had to improvise and it provided a strong national focus to get behind to get these defenses built and also we did not have like shortage of men really it was more about holding the territory so we had to Mm. During the mobilization, we had to pull everyone into the army, so 1.5 million men were mobilized, uh, including the 50 odd veterans from the First World War, and yeah, split into 42 divisions. Quite a bit. It wasn't like totally useless. And at this time, we actually had diplomatic agreements with France and Great Britain and they guaranteed our independence. So there was a pact of not only non-aggression, but also defensive alliance, where if one of the states was attacked, the other would automatically join the war. The German population joined the army. They mostly resisted it, but they, some of them did not really have a choice. So some of them did participate in the mobilization. However, they were 
really not cooperating because many, great many of them were actually under influence of the Reich's rhetoric at this point and they had their own leaders and they were uh, all riled up by uh, the push for Sudetenland so they wanted to take the border areas from Czech Republic that are bordering Germany and incorporate them into Germany because they seen them as German uh, in total in the whole state there was about 3 million Germans so it's not a small amount but at the same time it was not uh, there like the jure area at all they never held control over it in history yeah it was uh, and it was pretty vicious when uh, we'll get to the events later i'm gonna mention it so uh, this is the army composition we were prepared to re prepared to resist because as i said we had agreements with other ally nations like britain and france which were supposed to join the war if we were attacked in a defensive war so we relied on them and it was generally accepted that the, that would happen if the german aggression came However, there was a Munich agreement, so what happened is the Axis uh, in Germany actually organized a meeting in Munich to meet up with the representatives of France and England to uh, decide the fate of Czechoslovakia because at the time the Allies were not strong enough to face the Germans their industry was lacking, their military was lacking and they didn't feel like going to war over us so they decided that they would give us up instead so what happened, we were ordered by Chamberlain and France's Prime Minister to lay down our arms and let the Reich overtake us or we will face destruction alone which meant that our president, Benesh, actually signed it and he had to uh, seize control of our territory. So the men were ordered to put down their weapons and leave the fortifications. Hello, friendly computer, welcome. However, not many of these men really took it very well since they were pumped up for uh, the resistance that was coming a long time. Anschluss was a complete shit show, and if we had offered any sort of armed resistance, it would have been a complete humiliation for the Germans. Yeah, it's the same thing that's said here, but I'm not sure if it would be very good because, like, millions of people would die here. Of course, Germany would be defeated sooner, which means Europe would be spared of most of the fighting. It would definitely affect the course of history a lot. However, we as Czechoslovakia would cease to exist, probably. It would be just absorbed into other countries because we would be unable to man our own state basically because I'm pretty sure from the 13 million population we would be like maybe 5 million left. So I'm not sure if it turned out good or bad for the people in general but the soldiers were very unhappy that they were ordered to put down their arms and some of them resisted it, uh, they disobeyed some orders held some forts but it was very sparse resistance so the Germans managed to just uh, surround and execute which means that they reached Prague without any resistance and of course the collaborating crowds of the local German Czech population welcomed them with open arms and flags uh, in the Sudetenland what actually happened uh, the Sudetenland party ordered its citizens to take up arms and ambush police stations as well as military installations, kill any checks and seize any weapons or means of defense and assist the German army in their attack. I just got here but I found recently I've heard many arguments that Chamberlain was actually trying to show the world that Hitler sucked by making the agreement. Mm, yeah, that's what is common knowledge, like, the allies were not prepared for it, that's why they did it. Because, yes, they broke their word, they totally screwed us up, even though, uh, I'm not sure if I talked about this, I think I did at some point, but 
Uh, Czechs actually, like before we were absorbed into Austro-Hungarians or even Austrians actually in 1500s, before them in medieval times we are actually a big allies with France and our kings were actually fighting alongside their kings in big battles such as Krasi and we lost many uh, good men fighting there. We were fairly loyal allies for no good reason, nothing good to gain from it. Our young uh, rulers, our children were actually uh, educated in their universities where um, there was a big diplomatic bond and even after the First Republic was created we re-established these bonds very quickly and fruitfully. Yes. So that's why probably people think that, but at the time it was seen as a big nope. Uh, nobody trusted French and British anymore in terms of their independence. Like if they said that they would guarantee you, why would you believe them after this? And especially here amongst uh, our population, it was seen as a massive backstab and people really despised that. So what happened was they absorbed us, they first took Sudetenland and incorporated it into German territory and then took the rest of Bohemia and established a protectorate, which meant that it was a part of German territory, however it was governed separately by different Reich's official, however it was still a German in charge and everything was Germanized. Slovakia was established as a puppet nation and Hungary took some areas, as well as Poland took a little bit of Silesia. Um, yeah, Slovakia became a puppet nation, it had some divisions, it contributed to Wehrmacht and after the Czechs were absorbed, our troops mostly, as I said, were disbanded forcefully. Some of them fled abroad, um, not a few, especially the well-trained uh, fighters as well uh, like the um, flyers, pilots, as well as other people were despising the axis like the legionaries who actually held very strong uh, democratic ideas and couldn't be really forced to witness this happening to their country. So that happened. Actually I think friend the computer would find useful. I'm gonna quickly show the other slide. So this is the industrial, right? So we had 13 million citizens, 10th industrial, in industrial output in the world in 1928. We started building fortifications and then this is the Czechoslovakian uh, army numbers before the outbreak of the Munich Agreement. So 42 divisions, 1.5 million men, 350 tanks, 950 airplanes and most guns per capita in the world amongst the civilians. So definitely wasn't like we couldn't hold out for like a week, that's totally not true, especially with the fortifications that were in place. However, there were no fortifications at the Austrian border, so we we did not really count on the Anschluss of uh, Austria, which would prove instrumental in the Czech's defeat if the war did break out. However, it would still cost Germans a lot and it would dramatically affect the course of history. But that's not what happened, so Munich Agreement happened instead and so as I said many pilots and other personnel actually fled abroad, especially to France and especially to Britain. And they formed their own squadrons and they asked to be joined into foreign legion or even the Royal Air Force. Many of Austrian socialists and communists also fled to Czechoslovakia after February 1934. I, I imagine they had to flee again then, because it was not really uh, very safe for long. So let's take a look. So Operation Anthropoid itself, so it was initially a three-member group trained in Scotland with SOE, which is Special Operations Executive, uh, to learn sabotage using variety of weapons and explosives. Good time for fleeing. If you are a socialist or communist, then yes. In 1941, President in exile, Beneš agrees to the operation as for Czechoslovakia not to be seen as belligerent Axis power. Operation considered suicidal. So, uh, the Allies actually in 1941, they actually went to our exile government, which was established in London, I think, 
our uh, president was there with his cabinet and they approached us and said, hey, your people are not really resisting the Germans as much as we would like. So unless you do something really dramatic, we are going to consider you axis. And after the war, we are going to break you up in little bits of pieces and everybody is going to gobble them up. So you decide what happens next. Yes, some went to participate in the international brigades in Spain, others went to USSR, some were also killed by the Germans and murdered. Yeah, sounds about right. So the, our president actually agreed to the operation even though it was considered suicidal. The operation was supposed to be assassination of Rex protector Reinhard Heinrich, who has been appointed to take charge of Czech, uh, like the protectorate of Bohemia, to put down any rebellious activity and crack down on partisans, as well as purge the area of any non-Germans gradually. So he would have three solutions for Czech people, and that would be one, those who are close enough to being German, they would be incorporated. Second class would be those who are not ever going to be considered German, but they would be useful because they obey, therefore they will be kept alive for the foreseeable future. Not in camps, but they would be forced to operate the country, basically, man the industry under supervision. And then eventually, when the time comes, they would be disposed of. While the third uh, group were people who were not going to be German ever, and also were rebellious in their nature. And those would be eradicated immediately upon finding out that they exist. So those were his three primary goals. So, Reinhard Heinrich. Uh, Reinhard Heinrich was Rex protector of Protectorate of Bohemia. He was SS Obergruppenführer and Chief of Police and Internal Security in Third Reich. He organized the final solution and was head of conference at Wannsee that introduced it to practice. So this guy was the target. He was sitting pretty in Prague, commanding all the German occupation forces and he was responsible for many cruelties upon the population and also on other horrible stuff that happened in the Reich before and continued to happen even after his death because he was the head behind uh, how the final solution would come into practice. Uh, all right, let's move the slide. So the operatives were sent to. So the operatives were sent to. Czech occupied territory on 29 December 1941. At 2 o'clock in the night, they were dropped for an airplane inside Czech lands, and they then would have an objective of infiltration. So they would just try to lay low and establish contact with any partisan groups if they come across any. And they also were ordered to guide airstrikes upon Škoda Works, which were one of the major industry industrial uh, producers in Czech lands and they were pumping out artillery and tanks for the Germans. Actually, one more thing. I think the numbers I actually forgot. There were 2,200 artillery pieces in the army as well. So all of these things basically Germans seized by the way, except the manpower. They only got like maybe 200,000 Czechs who joined and uh, Germans after that. The, Czech Germans, we would join them, but from the Czechs, not many were enthusiastic about joining Wehrmacht, but some of them did. So they guided the airstrikes on Škoda Works. Unfortunately, it did not really work. Uh, the complex was barely even damaged and the operation was considered a failure. So they were supposed to carry on with their main objective, which was the assassination. So the operation operatives made contact with Yindra, a resistance fighter group, and met various partisans and supporters. Operatives did not share any information about planned, assass planned assassination, and yeah, they did not want any other people to be involved unnecessarily, so they did not know who to trust completely, and they were ordered to keep it secret, because overall I think only like eight people know about the entire operation. For quite some time the Praga PNH was the best tank in the Wehrmacht, the Wehrmacht had. Yeah, it was. And we also made the other German gear after uh, the seizure, so they ordered our factories to pump out their designs as well. So 
So on 27th May 1942, operatives meet another trained agent, Rodney Valchik, and they plan to ambush the target en route through a narrow turn in Praha district Liban. So their gear is was one submachine gun, Stan Mark II, and they had improvised explosive device made from anti-tank explosive round Mark 73. And this is a Czech anti-tank round and they made it into an IED. It looked like this. This is the cylinder the Wehrmacht captured later because what unfolded later was the assassination and one of the operatives tries to use stem on the passing vehicle but it malfunctions. Yeah. <laughs> Get a little piece of pipe. Second operative throw, throws the uh, IED which explodes under the car and you can see the car right here. So it exploded right after like, like under the right back tire. Reinhard Heinrich was injured by a piece of metal from the car body that shattered the 11th rib, pierced the di diagram and lodged in the spleen. He dies in the hospital a week later. There is actually a joke going around. I actually work in Liban, so this is my area that I work in. And we have this hospital there. It's called Pulovka and it's very large and it is also very horrible. So the services there are notoriously bad, at least currently. And the joke is that it actually wasn't the partisans who killed him, but it was the Bulovka and it was not a sabotage, but it was the incompetence of the staff. But no, I'm pretty sure it was the injuries. And it is uh, actually noted that he died from an infection in the wounds. So that probably happened from the shrapnel. At the time, they probably didn't really have um, the medical tech to really fix him up very well but they attempted everything they could because this man was very important for the big cheese in Berlin so he, they were ordered to do everything in their power to save him fortunately they did not succeed so he was uh, the assassination was successful and there is a rumor it was not confirmed because there is no evidence of it but the partisans themselves actually like I think they talked to some people about the assassination attempt and what they said was uh, after the explosion happened uh, Heinrich actually he was wounded quite severely but he ordered his driver to stop and they attempted to chase them so <laughs> they were chasing them around for quite a bit until they finally escaped and they took refuge in Church of St. Cyril and Methodius in Reslova Street in Prague and the priests know of them and their actions but decide to help them. So they managed to hide them in there and they mm, told them to never go out, never be seen and they would bring them food and everything and they would be just inside all the time. So that worked for a time approximately I think like it was two week stops something like that. SS launches full-scale manhunt with hundreds of interrogations using torture and bribery. So they tried to glean any information from anyone that could be associated with them. So another operative from another operation group betrays the assassins for money. His name was Karel Churda. He was also a Czech national. This is a picture down here. And he gives away all their associates who were quickly arrested. So he did not know where they were hiding but he knew of the similar contacts he had with the partisans and resistance fighter groups. So he took money from SS and gave them all these people's identities. So you can imagine what transpired next. So these people were all arrested. Those who did not cooperate were tortured and even executed. And what they gleaned from that was actually their location. So SS learns of operatives hideout and dispatches several hundred soldiers to lock down the area and seize them. I think overall it was like 400 men that were ordered to the area. Part of it, like about 80 men were actually SS and then 300 and something were a guard regiment of Wehrmacht and they would lock down the church from all sides. They would go into surrounding buildings, clear them and 
even establish machine gun positions and everything to surround it completely and they, then they would try to storm the church. So operatives are armed with several 9mm pistols and have limited ammunition. Total numbers of resistance fighters and operatives is 7 inside the church. SS units attempt to storm the church but are pushed back suffering several wounded men and the operatives split, defending upper church area uh, and four defending, so three of them were actually defending the upper church area and four of them were defending the crypt, shooting out of the basement windows. So the SS actually tried to storm it, even with automatic weapons, but they were repulsed, so they did not want to suffer any unnecessary men killed. So they did not charge in recklessly again, but rather they tried to shoot through the windows and then tried another tactic which was they called out the Prague's uh, firefighters and ordered them to flood the basement with a fire hose they would stick into the, one of the basement's windows and that would work for a little bit but then the partisans constantly pushed the, uh, pushed the uh, hose out and shot at them so they didn't really manage to achieve their task there was like a knee height tops water inside the crypt eventually Sorry, we're close have to go. No, pro no problem, Mort Cal. Glad to have you at least for a little bit. So the end. Of the three men defending the church, two commit suicide by firearms and one bleeds out from his injuries. The SS break into the church area where the four remaining men save their last bullets and commit suicide on the SS entering. It was actually noted by the German troops reports that when they entered the crypt and the church the partisans were actually yelling uh, something like we are Czechs we never surrender and then they did not take anyone alive which they actually wanted to do because they wanted to interrogate them to find out exactly who ordered uh, the operation everything like that so uh, that was a bummer for them nobody of the resistance fighters or the guys survived so bodies are pulled out where high-ranking ss inspect them they are seen spitting and viciously kicking the bodies which are then transferred to an undisclosed location to have their skulls taken and sent to germany bodies are dumped in an open grave in one of the big cemeteries the aftermath operation is considered a success with target eliminated and checks seen as assisting with fighting the third reich dozens of resistance fighters are executed SS launches uh, two purges of Czech villages, massacring civilians as an act of revenge, destroying the villages entirely and sending survivors to death camps. After war, Betrayer Churda is executed by hanging in 1947. And lastly, we take a look. So this, these are the photos of the men involved in the operation. So these two are actually the main protagonists who actually committed the uh, assassination and these are the guys that were in them, uh, with them in the uh, church, the resistance. So I think that's enough talk about the anthropoid. I think it is uh, fairly misinterpreted. Uh, part of our history because many movies or even people who actually talk about it really think that it happened differently they don't really verify their sources so even the movies actually portray the uh, resistance as wielding machine guns or even like submachine guns grenades in the church last stand which did not really happen they only had several pistols and none of the SS were killed during the last assault, so uh, that's also misinterpreted. But overall it was a successful operation. As I said, the Allies wanted us to do something, otherwise they would consider us an Axis Belgian power. So it was important that this would succeed. Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. If not, that is totally fine. We are gonna just call it.
I think about an hour is usually what we do for these history episodes, so I don't feel like it should be too long, which is actually good. Finn asks, what happened to the government in exile after the end of the war? Yeah, that is actually an important topic to talk about. So what happened next was in 1945, they came back and established the Republic again. However, it was not meant to last because in 1948, the communists actually rigged elections and with help of Slovakian threats of invasion, they managed to uh, overthrow our government and establish us as a socialist republic under the influence of USSR. So that led to many political purges. They actually, the commies went after our veterans. They killed many of our mm, people who actually were fighting in Royal Air Force or even abroad in Foreign Legion and many of the people who actually survived through World War I, they returned back home just to be invaded again. They fought the Germans and they were killed in some tank or cellar by a freaking NKVD officer with a round to the back of the head or hanging as some sort of common thief or criminal, which is despicable. This part of our history is despised. And the government was forced to sign uh, that the overthrow of the government was actually legal and then they would be let go, apart from the president which would be kept by the Soviets as a puppet, I think. So, that's what happened next and we were under the Soviet rule all the way until 1989. Did Prague have a Jewish ghetto like Warsaw? No, it did not. All the Jews from Prague were actually transported by the SS via trains uh, to Poland or our own camp. Mm, we had one camp in the Czech Republic's mm, borders in total and it was at Terezin, which is one of the old forts. And it was not a death camp, it was a work camp, which is Quite similar, but there were no gas chambers in Terezin, and the, it was used for transport of prisoners further up the chain into Poland, where most of the camps actually were. So a lot of Czech Jews actually died in the occupation. Some of them did manage to escape, of course, but. A lot of them did not. Same goes for the other uh, ethnics the Nazis were after, so they packed them all together, sort of. I'm going to actually check something out. I think it's just playing some random music at this point. Not good. I'm pretty sure some of it was copyright. Uh,
Yeah, uh, the Czech president Beneš actually after he was used to ratify the USSR's uh, overthrow of our government, he actually committed uh, not, not committed suicide. He had two strokes in quick succession and died. So that was the end of him. But I think he was kept as a puppet initially, but then probably just died. So, yeah. Because they needed some sort of justification. The overthrow was definitely not justified. So I think that's going to be it for today. But I might be up with something else later, maybe. When did this story of Anthropoid become public knowledge? It was actually public knowledge at the time it happened because Germans were immediately looking for the culprits. So it spread like wildfire. So it was, there was no, like, even, not even consideration of hiding it. Instead, it just became viral, basically. And um, people knew more details, of course, after the war because investigations were launched and actually one of the interesting bits is the skulls from the partisans and operatives that the Nazis actually took they never were found and Nazis had this habit of taking skulls from people like these and then displaying them in their medical institutions so after the war uh, there were people who were extensively looking for these skulls and uh, wanted to bury them with the rest of the bodies as uh, it would be appropriate but unfortunately they were they were never found So I hope that it was at least a little interesting. I think that not many people outside Czech Republic or Slovakia actually are aware of this operation at all. So that could be interesting to you, I think. Uh, only a slight problem uh, with it that many sources are actually inaccurate. So I had to look for quite a while to only give you the verified information while the little tidbits I say uh, I usually mention if it's not a verified source yeah we are going to decide the next historical moment shortly I'm going to post a discord announcement for it so you can drop by and vote on it I would appreciate some feedback on the next topic to cover so I'm not going to rate I don't think can I just end it here? But I might be up with something else later. You'll see if I feel like it. So thanks for tuning in and see you around. Bye.